Well, I mentioned to you last night that we were going to start promptly at 8.45, and according to the clock there, I'm 30 seconds late. Uh, so uh, I'll give you those 30 seconds, I know you have to give me those 30 seconds back sometime later this morning. Um, again, my name is Harry Metzger. I'm uh, part of the steering committee for the Reformation Society of Pittsburgh. Uh, again, the other members that are on the committee are Mark Sampson standing there in the back, uh, Ben Riach and Bruce Bick, whom you will hear again just in a moment, and then Jerry O'Neill's over here. And I saw Patrick Marks in the building somewhere, but I don't see him now. So um, if you have any questions about the Reformation Society of Pittsburgh, please let us know. Again, our next conference will be on November 15th and 16th, and our topic will be the rallying cries of the church. And again, if you don't know what that means, join us on November 15th and 16th. Um, today our topic it will be continuing the idea of, uh, of uh, freedom in Christ. And we'll be looking at Romans 7 uh, by Dr. Bruce Bickle, and then Romans 8 by Dr. Ben Riach, and then our last session is I'll be trying to wrap up the uh, session and looking at the, the four freedoms that we have in Jesus Christ. So I think we're ready for you, Bruce, if you are ready. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks that we could again gather this morning, and thank you for the beauty of your word, and I pray that you would uh, anoint uh, Bruce and, and Ben this morning and uh, use them for your honor and glory in our lives. I pray that we might learn and that we might understand your word better so that we might apply it more carefully in our lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. We now ask you to, uh, to draw near to us as we purpose to draw near to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bruce Bickle. Thank you, sir. Romans 7. Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be with you today. Thank you for coming back. We always, uh, with some trepidation, close a Friday night wondering who's going to show up on Saturday. <laughs> so thank you for the encouragement. I invite you to turn your Bibles, please, to, Matthew, uh, to uh, Romans chapter 7. Last night, uh, Ben did a wonderful job of teaching us how we are free from being slaves to sin, and now we are slaves now to, to God himself. We, we went through justification by faith alone in chapter 5, where we defended the doctrine of justification by faith alone, as Paul did that in chapter 5. And the results of that were, the consequences of our being justified by faith is that we have peace with God, we have access to God, we have assurance from God, we are indwelt by God, and we're preserved by God. Now one might logically say, if sin is to increase so that grace can abound, what about obedience? Well, as we talked about that last night, we're free from sin being our master, and we are now slave to God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher of England in the, several decades ago, said, if the grace you have does not motivate you for obedience, then you don't have grace. And that's exactly what Ben taught us last night, that we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're a slave to God. Today we're going to talk about being free from the law. Justification by faith alone frees us from sin. There's freedom from the law. And to, to, after I finish today, Ben is going to teach us freedom from condemnation. So chapter 6 is freedom from sin. Chapter 7 is freedom from the law. And chapter 8 is freedom from condemnation. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles, please, to... Romans chapter 7, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version today of Romans chapter 7. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will not be called, she'll be called an adulterer if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we are living in the flesh, 
our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not had been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what is, it is to covet if the law had said, not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is both is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through, the, through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold unto sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but now the ability to carry it out, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that within I, what I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. For I see in my members another war, law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. May God be pleased to open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from his word. Well, this section of Paul's letter to the church at Rome has to do with our freedom from the law as a means of earning our salvation. And what Paul means when he says that we're, we're free from the law, he's talking about free from the moral law, not the ceremonial law. He's talking about referring to the law that has a general rule of all mankind. So this is not the ceremonial law he says we're free from, it's the moral law. Now what Paul says when he says we're no longer under the law, he means by this that we're no longer in a system or a position of trying to earn our salvation, to save ourselves, to justify ourselves, or to sanctify ourselves, and to make ourselves fit to stand before God in all of his holiness. He's saying that's the way in which we are no longer under the law. So we are no longer in a position that the Jews were in when the Old Covenant said, do this and you will live, which means if you do what you do, I will love you. And God will say, I will be pleased with you if you do this. We're no longer in that position. That is what is meant by being under the law. It means that the law is a means or a method of saving ourselves and justifying ourselves before God. And the glory of the Christian gospel is that we're no longer in that position. We are now under grace. We are no longer trying to satisfy ourselves, to justify ourselves, to sanctify ourselves and, and with conformity to the law. As Paul tells us in Romans 10:4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believed. Now it's only in that sense are we free from the law, under the law. Now we need to understand this. It does not mean for a moment that we don't care about the law, that we don't honor it, that we don't obey it. That's not what he's talking about. He's only talking about you're no longer under law when he says you're no longer under the law as a means or an opportunity of trying to earn your own justification, determine your own salvation, and earn your pleasing status before God. It has nothing to do with our obedience to the law. It's about the means of earning our salvation or justification. And quite honestly, the most dangerous side of antinomianism, which is against the law, is for any Christian to say, we're not interested in the law anymore. 
because we're under grace. And that should never, the Christian should never say farewell to the law. Thank God we are no longer under that as a means of earning our salvation and our justification and sanctification. But we are to keep the law. We are to honor the law. We are to practice it in our daily lives. In fact, the whole purpose of the gospel really is to put us in a position so that we can obey his law. Apart from that, we cannot obey it. So we need to understand the difference. We're not saying the Christian should never say farewell to the law. It's just we're saying farewell to that system or that process where we justify ourselves, sanctify ourselves, and earn our own salvation in our own strength. And that is because we have a new relationship to Christ, as we saw last night in Ben's teaching. When a woman is married to a man, she is bound to that man until he dies. And then she's free to marry once he dies. Now, before we were in Christ, we were bound by the law and we were condemned by it. The law, however, didn't die. We died in Christ. And so we are no longer married to that system of being under the law, which says you must justify yourself in your own strength. We are now married to Jesus Christ, and the law is, has no control over us as a means of earning our justification or salvation or sanctification. You see, our husband has no control of us, the husband being the law anymore. We're now controlled, as Ben taught us last night, we're a slave to God. We're in a wonderful new relationship that we are no longer under the law as a means of earning our salvation. So let me give you some illustrations of the limits of the law. In verses 7 through 10, God used the law to reveal the sinfulness of the flesh. One of the things that the law does is it reveals the sinfulness of our flesh. When you look at the big picture of the law, it was given for us for three major things. Now this is looking at the law from 100,000 feet. First of all, it was to reveal God's righteousness, holiness, and justice. It's a description of God's holiness and his righteousness. The second reason it was given was so that society would have a moral code to have a foundation of a civilized society under the administration of magistrates and officials. It was designed to give a moral code, a moral foundation to a society. And thirdly, it was a means of telling the redeemed people of God how they could please God by fulfilling the law, not in their own strength, but by trusting the person and work of Christ. So now we understand that the key to understanding chapter 6 and chapter 7 is really understanding chapter 5. In Romans 5.20, Paul gives us that key. He's been describing how the believer is in Christ and no longer in Adam. That's the key to our understanding chapter 6 and chapter 7 is understanding the latter part of chapter 5 where it says you're no longer in Adam. You're now in Christ and you are now a slave to God. So Paul deals with this connection that someone would say that there is no longer a standard of conduct and behavior because it is the law that has always guaranteed the preservation of God's holiness. He deals with that now in chapter 7. Another, he's saying that under the law, if you're under grace, puts the law aside and therefore there is nothing to maintain God's holiness. He's going to deal with that objection because that's the objection that people are throwing at him in chapter 7. We saw the objection last night was if grace is to abound, does that mean we want to sin more? And absolutely not. You're free from being slave to sin. And now he says you're free from being a slave to the law as a means of earning your justification and salvation. Now, in chapter 7, he also teaches us that sanctification in our own methods is as impossible as earning our own justification by our own methods. He also deals with that in chapter 7. And as we've already seen in verses 1 to 8, shows that the Christians who are, not in, are in a new relationship by, with the law, and that it's an essential order that we understand that bearing fruit from God is a result of our newness in life, not because of our own efforts. So in verses 7 to 12, Paul vindicates the law, and he verifies it and validates it. And he proves that the law must never be held responsible for our failure to keep it. He's saying it's not the law's fault that we don't keep it. It's sin that is in us that causes us to do that. Grace is going to be victorious. Now, the thing we need to understand is that Paul talks about the great struggle that he has, but he also talks about the great victory. There's a great victory in this struggle. While all people have a general knowledge of certain things about good and evil, they have a general knowledge of sin, Paul really teaches us that we are not fully aware of the real nature of sin until we are confronted with the law. In other words, one of the great problems of the church is that we don't teach the law. 
Because it is the law that really teaches us the heinousness and the seriousness of sin. And Paul is saying, until you're really confronted with the law, you're never really going to understand the seriousness of sin and how damaging it can be. You never have a right understanding of sin until you have a right understanding of the essential character of the law. When you have a, an understanding of the essential character of the law, you're going to have an understanding of the essential character of sin. And it is the law of God that gives us a right conception of the true character and nature of sin. Now, you've heard the illustration, I'm sure, about the counterfeit agents who study the $1 bill. I have a friend in the Naval Academy who was an FBI agent, and he became a bogus $1 bill expert, a counterfeit expert. And he told me how he learned to discern that which is false from that which is true. He said, for six weeks, they gave me a dollar bill and said, do anything you want with it. I want you to eat it. I want you to put water on it. I want you to run over it with your car. I want you to put it in the less test tubes. Do whatever you want to do. But you become so familiar with a perfect $1 bill that when you see a bogus one, you're going to recognize it. And so you can take him in a situation and give him 10 $1 bills, blindfold him, take the blindfold off, and one of those 10 is a fake, and he'll be able to spot it. It's because he mastered that which is the true. Now, that's what we need to understand. We need to master the law as a means of exposing that which is false. You're not going to discover that which is false by studying the system of this world. You're going to find out what is false by studying the law. And that is what Paul is saying. He vindicates the law in our position of our life because it is the means by which we will understand the seriousness and the true character of our sin. And the moment a person underestimates the nature and character of sin... He becomes troubled about his soul and seeks a Savior. In other words, when the law exposes that in a person, they begin to seek the Savior. And the problem with people who are not seeking a Savior for their salvation is that they do not understand the true nature and heinousness of sin. That's the reason they don't seek a Savior, because they don't think they have a need, because they've never been exposed by the law. You see, it's the peculiar function of the law to bring such an understanding to a person's conscience. Notice the role of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, verses 7 to 15. We talked about that last night. The role of the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, is to convict us of our sin, convince us of our sin, convert us from our sin, give us comfort in a new way of life, and control the life as we lead under the Spirit. And his whole role is to convict us and convince us of sin. That's only going to be happening when you preach the law, and so people are exposed to the true heinousness and seriousness and character of sin. In my study of the Puritans years ago, those great evangelists, they always engaged what they called law work in their preaching. They engaged in what was known as law work. In their preaching of the gospel, they generally started with a presentation of the law, knowing that a person would not understand salvation unless they really understood the nature and character of sin. So they practiced and preached the law of God, showing its relevance and by means of it, how it brought men and women to an understanding of what sin really means in the sight of God. And it produced a desire to seek the Savior. Now, nothing but the law can do that, Paul tells us. Nothing but the law can do that. Law is essentially spiritual and is concerned with a person's heart and his ultimate attitude towards God. And Paul goes on to say that if it was only when he understood the meaning of the law that he understood the truth about the true nature and character of sin. He never had known that before the law opened his eyes to this. He understood that lust was now a sin because the law exposed that. And he realized this, the desire to sin is sin. The desire to sin is sin. And there's no better way of testing our understanding of the Christian doctrine of salvation than to understanding the true nature of sin. If you really want to understand salvation, you've got to understand the true nature of sin. Some of the great Puritan works deal with that, and a couple I would recommend for your reading would be Thomas Watson's work, The Deceitfulness of Sin. The Deceitfulness of Sin. And Jeremiah Burroughs has a wonderful book, The Evil of Evils, talking about sin and its true character until you really understand that. And really what they're doing in both of those books is they're just teaching the law because it is the law that's going to expose the true heinousness of sin. And so the sin, Paul tells us, sin used the law to rekindle the sinfulness of his flesh. And thus natural people who do not know the Savior are doomed by the law because it exposes the sinfulness of their flesh. Now there's nothing so foreign to biblical teaching than the notion that sin is purely negative. Essentially that's what we teach today. That is the common attitude. We're told that we must not talk about sin 
as something in and of itself. But what we really mean is that there are certain things that we would like to see in somebody that they don't have. And so, in other words, we can't say that that man is a bad man. We just say he's not a good man because we don't want to call sin, sin, because we take a negative position of what sin is. We shouldn't say that man is positively evil and vile, but he is just not developed in the way we'd like to see him develop. So that's how we approach sin in the church, unfortunately. The modern church concept of sin is purely negative. It merely talks of the absence of certain qualities. He doesn't have this, she doesn't have that, but we don't say the person is evil. That's because we've taken a purely negative view of what sin is. And we basically say education and training and mentoring will produce all the good things that they don't have, but we don't say that they're an evil person. Jonathan Edwards, and I don't mean to offend anybody, and I know your children were the most beautiful things ever created, but Jonathan Edwards says, until you realize that your sinful baby who was just born is a sinful viper, you'll never understand what it means to be a parent. You see, we're just afraid to say that. I have a friend who is the most beautiful little girl. She's five years old now. And if you want the definition of a sinful little viper, she's it. <laughs> My wife is a pediatrician, and Becky said, in 35 years of pediatric medicine, I've never run into a child who is so evil. Five years old, the most beautiful little thing you'll ever see. And her parents know that. Her mother says, I know she's a sinful little viper because you've told me that. And she's doing a wonderful job raising this child, but she's dealing with the fact that she understands this. Oh, my child just doesn't need to be developed. My child is sinful. My child is an evil little viper. And she's now directing her parent parenting skills are based upon that understanding. And she's making wonderful headway with her child. You'll see the child is just sometimes so delightful. Other times she's so evil. And so she prays with her every day. She reads her the scripture. She's doing all those things that a parent should be dealing with. But she understands this. I've got to do that because I know that she's evil. She's a sinful little viper. You see, we don't teach that in the church. We just basically say she's not fully developed yet because her self-esteem hasn't been created such. And so we create self-esteem as the panacea when self-esteem is the disease, not the cure. You see, somebody who has a self-esteem problem, if you're a Christian, you're thinking too much about yourself and not enough about God. We're just afraid to call evil evil. We're afraid to call sin sin because we basically take in the church a negative view of what sin is rather than understanding there's a positive side of it, that that person is just evil. Now here is where Paul deals with the positive side of sin. So he says, would you like to know how strong sin is? Sin is so powerful that it can even use as God's own holy word to its own end. It is so powerful that it will take God's holy, wall and holy law and use it to its own end. God gave us the holy law through Moses, and sin is so strong that it even uses that holy law as a fulcrum or base of operation to bring about its own purposes. In other words, he takes God's holiness and exposes our sin. Sin is made to be very evident that it was not the law as such, but it was sin, in the present case, Paul's own sinfulness, that made him responsible for his own conduct. The commandment operating by itself never kills anybody or hurts anyone. It's the sin that kills. It was the sin that deceived Paul in his unconverted state into thinking that he was able to live a life of strict obedience that would please God. And in that, it deceived him. You see, the law was used by the evil one, to basically create its own end. That was to teach Paul that you can do this on your own. And he discovered by the law that he couldn't do that. Until one day, in a very dramatic way, it was made very clear to him that no matter how hard he tried, he would never, no never, be able to thus attain to the status of righteousness before God that the law required. And Paul had stated that the commandment brought death to him in verse 10. But how can something that is so holy and so righteous and good bring about death? Paul answers it by this saying, It is not the commandment operating by itself which brings death. It is the transgression of the commandment that brings death. In the final analysis, therefore, sin is the cause of death. And the serious character of sin becomes apparent in the very fact that 
in order to expose the sinner, it makes use of something that is perfectly perfect, and that is God's law. God's holy law is the means that is used to expose the sinful nature of ourselves. The very holiness, that is God's moral, pure law, God's commandment, makes the vileness of sin stand out all the more. You see, how does, the, how does sin use the law? Well, it does so by first arousing in us the, the, the recognition and the alertness of the fact that we are rebellious. We were born rebels. We're born with an antagonism toward God that's within us. And that's the fundamental principle of the scripture. Remember Romans 5.10, we were enemies. In Romans 8.7, we're enmity with God. You see, we're, we're born wanting to be autonomous. And the most offensive thing that we are confronted with when you teach the law or the scripture is this. There's somebody who you're going to need to bow your knee to. And that is an offense to the unregenerate. They don't want to hear that. Why do you think that society now wants to remove the Ten Commandments from buildings and from schools? It's because they don't want to be reminded that there's somebody that they're going to have to bow their knee to in eternity, and they want to live their life autonomously and say, I can live my own life the way I want. I'm a rebel, and I don't want to submit to anything. And the reason we don't want the Ten Commandments taught, we don't want them on buildings anymore, is because it exposes the rebelliousness of society. And you see, that's why it happens. You take something like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. We've relegated that purely to just using profanity. But really, the spirit behind that is this. You have thoughts that are unworthy of God. That's why you speak the way you do. Because you have a thought that is unworthy of God. That's what it means to, to break the Ten Commandments, to take the Lord's name in vain. I have a thought that is unworthy of God. Do you know what one of those thoughts is? God isn't fair. That's a violation of the Ten Commandments because you've created a thought that is unworthy of the character, nature, and attributes of God. He is righteous, he's holy, but nowhere does it ever say God is fair. And when you talk about the wonderful, compassionate, merciful doctrine of election, that's not fair. Right there is a violation of the commandment because you have a thought that is unworthy of the character and nature of God. All you see the law does is expose our rebelliousness. And that means I'm not going to submit to anything because I get to live my life autonomously. I get to be the captain of my own ship, the captain of my own soul. And so what the law does, it just reveals and exposes the rebelliousness of our society. And so they don't want the law to be exposed. They don't want to be confronted with the law because it has that imposition upon us. Because we are the 21st century people, we can do what we want. We have technology that improves the quality of our lives. And the natural man hates the, the notion that there is someone to whom he's going to have to submit and bow his knee. So let me make a few applications as we're going through this. First of all, if we're not clear about the true nature, character, and essence of sin, we'll never really understand the teaching of the Bible. The entirety of the biblical doctrine teaching concerning salvation is based upon a clear understanding of sin and its character. We shall never understand why we have to die to the law if we do not understand the true nature of sin. We shall never understand why the Son of God had to come and pay the ransom for our sin unless we understand the heinousness of sin itself. We shall never see the necessity of regeneration and the rebirth if you don't understand sin. How do we start in our evangelism campaigns? And I don't mean to be offensive to anybody. We start off with something like this. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The Puritans started off with this. God is holy. They started with the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the person and work of Christ, and repentance and faith. You see, oftentimes in our evangelism today, we offer the benefits of the gospel. But we don't offer the gospel. We're saying, do you want this rather than do you want him? And so that's because we've started off with offering the benefits. Would you like to have contentment about peace, joy? Would you like to have a better job? Then come to Jesus. 
You see, we've made that so trite because we bypass this issue of the heinousness and the true character and essence of sin. Until you understand that, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, you're really never going to understand the true nature of salvation and the need for regeneration and rebirth until you understand that. And that's what the law does. It kindles that in us. And the unregenerate rebels against that because the law exposes that and it says, I want to live my life the way I want. And you're telling me that I'm going to have to bow my knee to somebody? I'm not going to do that because that exposes our rebelliousness. So that is why so many people think they can just decide to invite Jesus into their life. I can just decide to do that. I can decide to invite Jesus into my to life as the way they are. How many times have you heard somebody say this? God just loves you the way you are. Well, if that's true, then why did he die for you? You see how simple we've made it? We've eliminated what Paul is teaching us about the whole character and nature of sin, which the law exposes. And so we have to be careful not to be antinomian and that we discard the law and we say, we're farewell to it. We need to honor it. We need to preach it. We need to teach it. We need to obey it. We need to instruct people in it because that's the means by which people will understand the need for regeneration. And so we've trivialized evangelism, in my judgment, so much in the last 150 years because we've eliminated the true nature of sin because all we say is, well, he's a good person. He just needs to be developed a little bit more. So our problem today really is one of most of us. Our troubles today are due to our failure to grasp and understand the biblical doctrine of sin. And that's what Paul teaches us in chapter 7. Now, in verses 14 through 25, which follows 7 to 13, Paul, now the believer, reflecting on his own situation and that of others like him, begins to discuss the, the struggle and the victory of living a life in the, new, in the new covenant. He clearly and openly confesses, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I'm a sold out a slave to sin. He admits, therefore, that although absolute goodness is attributed to God's law, it cannot be perfected in himself in his own strength. He knows that as long as he acts on his own strength, he's going to continue in the struggle. But verse 25 is the great victory of this struggle. But thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, sometimes, <laughs> folks, when you're in your struggle, you just need to read verse 725. See, one of the greatest indications of the validity of your salvation may be your struggle because if you didn't have that struggle it would be you might be unregenerate because you wouldn't care about it but the struggle may be a backhanded way of saying you're a true saving faith you do have true saving faith and we need to remind ourselves this but thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ that's the great victory in the struggle that Paul goes through in verses 7 through 24 Yes, life is a struggle. I don't want to do these things, but I find myself wanting to do that. And the thing I want to do, I don't do. Why is that? It's because sin is working in me. There's this principle of sin that says, even in my best efforts, they're going to be tainted. Because there's this principle of sin. But he says, remember this, the great victory is this, but thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul generally declares the fact that it, he had been sold out as a slave to sin. He confesses this. Indeed, that which I am accomplishing I do not approve of. For not what I do, I want to do, that do I practice. But what I loathe, that I do. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, it is the evil I do not want to do, that it, this is what I practice. Now, is not that, that the conflict that all of us have? Even in our best efforts, the things that I do, that I do well are tainted. Because there's this subtlety back in the back of my mind saying, you know, do I really have to do that? Now, isn't this the same conflict that Paul mentions in Galatians 5, 17, when the apostle writes, the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh? For these are opposed to each other, so that the very things you may wish to be doing, these you are not doing. And then in Philippians 3, 12, 13, not that I have already obtained this or am ready, already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me thus his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to lies ahead, I move ahead. You see, one of the real issues of our Christian maturity, the real definition of our Christian maturity is not whether or not you're going to fail. You're going to fail. The real issue is how quickly do I rebound when I have failed? 
And that's because you remember 725. But thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's the victory in this struggle. Yes, we're all going to fail. And the real test of our maturity as a follower of Christ is how quickly do I rebound when I get back up off the ground when I have failed. The very fact that Paul tells us in his inner being, Paul does really not want to do the things that he's doing. The contrary to God's will, but he detests that situation. It fills him with courage. Now, when you read this, Paul is saying, those things that I don't want to do that I find myself don't defeat me, they really give me courage to what? To run the race that's before me because I know this, thanks be to God through the victories in Christ Jesus. So he takes this struggle and says, it becomes a motivation for me to have endurance to struggle and it gives me the motivation because it gives me courage, courage to continue in the battle because I know the victory's already been won. You should never forget when you read Romans chapter 7, verse 25. But thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the victory. And he said, when I go through this struggle, it really gives me the courage to want to get up off of the ground when I failed. That's a sign of our maturity. Here's what he says. For according to my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see in my mind bodily members a different law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And here's the great cry of victory. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so his summary statement, So then, I myself with my mind serve the law of God, but with my flesh the law of sin. Now that does not cancel out the essence of the assurance of victory expressed in these memorable words. Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's where our hope. We have hope not despair because we understand the victory in verse 25. Now after the, this defeating experience by the law, I want to take us to help us understand the law of sin and death is simply an operation of our old nature. Now what we need to understand is God does not remake and give us a remold nature. He gives us a new nature and he crucifies the old one. And so we, have the, we now have the ability to can sin, yes, we can still sin, but we have the desire now to be holy. Yes. We have that desire to be holy because that is the new nature. So while the old nature was crucified, it is still there, and because we're in an unredeemed body, it is still going to be there, and that's our struggle. But we have a new nature now that gives us the desire and the ability and the perspective of wanting to do something different because we now are, are bound in our resurrection life with Christ. So the law of sin and death is simply the operation of the old nature. So that when the believer wants to do good, evil is still present. I mean, just take a look at pride. You know, we talk about all the external sins, and we, we take the public sins much more seriously than we do the sins of the Spirit. Do you realize the sins of the Spirit are more heinous in God's eyes than the sins of the flesh? We talk about adultery. We talk about abortion. Why don't we talk about greed? When was the last time you ever heard a sermon on greed? You know, what is the great American cancer? It's greed. That's the great American cancer of our culture, is greed. Several years ago when I was with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, I was conducting a chapel service for one of the baseball teams in the city of Pittsburgh, or the city of Chicago where I was serving. It was during the baseball strike. So I talked on greed. <laughs> Needless to say, they didn't come up and ask me to preach again. <laughs> but I had one member if I gave you his name, you would fully recognize it because he's very, very well known. Now, I'm not going to give his name because I'm not asking his permission to do that, so to honor him, I won't. But here was our conversation. He came up to me afterwards and said, hey, I'm not greedy. I just want one penny more than what, what anybody else gets. But I'm not greedy. I just want one penny more than what everybody else has paid. You see the great, we don't talk about that. We just say, oh, he's a Hall of Famer. That's okay. He just hasn't been taught well yet. That's an evil thought. That's a sinful thought. That's an offense to God. Do we deal with that? No. We just begin to say it's just a negative. He hasn't been developing some education and training, getting some scripture memory, and he'll be okay. Rather than saying, that's sin. That's evil. That's, we don't talk about the sins of the flesh. You see, the church has a warped idea of what sin is because we don't preach the law enough. And Paul says, you're never going to understand the serious nature and essence of sin until you preach the law. So Paul tells us, the carnal man 
The old nature is not subject to the law of God, neither deed can it be. The law of sin and death is counteracted by the law of the Spirit, he tells us, Spirit of Christ. And it is not by submitting to outward laws that we grow in holiness, but it's surrendering to the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit's convict, convince, convert, comfort, and control. That's his role with us, guiding us into all truth. And this law or principle is elaborated in chapter 8, which Ben will touch on in a few moments. And so what's the practical application of all this? Simply this. In our new position before God, as dead to the law, we are not expected to obey God in our own strength. We are not expected to obey God in our own strength. Sometimes the best you can do this. I'm going to do the best I can and trust Christ with the rest. Sometimes that's the best we can do. God has not enslaved us under what I would call a new Christian law system that we must obey in order to be holy. Rather, he's given us the Holy Spirit to enable us to obey his law, to fulfill his commands and the demands of his holiness. That's what you see in Ezekiel chapter 36, which I touched on last night. He calls us to himself. He cleanses us from ourselves. He creates a new life within us. He completes us with the Holy Spirit, and he causes us to be obedient. Just who takes responsibility for your obedience? God does. Now, that doesn't mean that we sit back and let go and let God. I'm not saying that. Please understand, I'm not saying that. Obedience is a fight, but it's, you don't do it in your own strength. Sometimes you have just to say, Lord, take that thought from my mind because if you let me dwell on it, I'll, I'll be defeated. It's a disaster. You've got to guide me into all truth. It's a real struggle. But at the same time, what that is doing is confirming your regeneration because if you didn't have that struggle, you wouldn't be regenerated. You wouldn't be thinking about it anyway. That's why you need to think of 725, but thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this great victory. And the struggle that you and I go through, Paul says, really is a cause for courage and perseverance. It really motivates you to want to not trust yourself anymore and to trust the work of the Holy Spirit. And so certainly the minute we start doing things that works in our own strength, we discover that we're failures. And sad to say, many well-meaning Christians get stuck right there. Well, I tried it, it didn't work, and so they just give it up. They throw the baby out with the bathwater. What Paul is telling us, the truths of chapter 7, that we are indeed failures in ourselves, but the law is good, and then allow the Holy Spirit to work out God's will within us. We often talk about, I want to be in God's will. You heard such things as, I just want God's best. What's that suggesting? God has the second best? I want God's perfect will. What's that suggesting? He's got a will that's less than perfect? Do you see how we look at things? We look at things from the lens of our own eyes, from our own sinfulness, which is that sinful principle within us, rather than looking at it through the Spirit of God, which says, but thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God's will is, there are six verses in Scripture that teach you what God's will is. God's will is the same for all of us. We're saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, suffering, and saying thanks. That's it. Those are the six verses that tell everybody what God's revealed will is. Now, we, we have a struggle because we're always looking for the secret will. Yeah. That's what we're looking for. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The secret things are known by God. Those things that are revealed are for you and for the next generation. We spend all of our time saying, I wonder what God wants me to have, what job he wants me to have. Bingo! Secret, guess what? You're not going to find it. Because it's secret. But he, we'll tell you this. I can tell you how, what you need to be if you take that job. But you're not going to find something that drops down and says PNC, Mellon, or U, UPMC, or Geneva College, or RPTS. You're not going to find that. But we'll tell you this. If you go to RPTS, if you work at Geneva, if you work at PNC, I'm going to tell you what you need to be. And that's saved, sanctified, spirit-filled, submissive, saying thanks, and suffering. Those are the six, six things of God's will. That's his revealed will for all of us. And what Paul is saying is this. When you try to live up to a standard of Christian lawmaking to, to do God's will, you're going to see yourself just as a failure, just as much as when you're exposed by the law. So we are not under a new Christian law system. We're under a system that is now fed by the Spirit of Christ. And we trust the work of the Holy Spirit. And so now we recognize that even in my best efforts, what I do, what I do is going to be tainted. Let me give you just a quick summary as we close this portion. 
because Paul in the latter portions of chapter 7 really dis reveals three things that we need to take a look at. First of all, the truth about the unregenerate. We need to understand the unregenerate. He also teaches us the truth about the power of sin. And thirdly, the truth about the limits of the law. Let's take a look at each of these quickly. Here's some things that Paul teaches us about the truth about the unregenerate. He is wrong about his view of the law and is wrong about his view of himself. The unregenerate is pleased with himself and thinks that he can justify himself by his works. The unregenerate is totally unaware of the sinful nature that is within him, that he has, a, has been sold under sin. They don't understand that. He never talks about sin as Paul does in this passage. He never says that he hates sin. He may be annoyed with himself when he suffers the consequences of his choices, but that does not mean that he hates the choice that he made or the sin that caused it. He very much dislikes the consequences of his sin, but would have the sin, would have the sin without the consequences if possible. In other words, he does not have an understanding of the true nature of sin. He does not know anything of the true nature or the meaning of the law, so he does not have a desire to keep it and to live according to it. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 7 about the unregenerate, just a summary statement. Now here's his summary statement about the truth about the law, the truth about the power of, the, of sin. The first thing we learn is that sin dwells in us takes up at home in us. We should not think of sin that is something outside of us. David said the same thing in Psalm 51, that we're born in sin. It is in us from the very beginning. It is not something that we acquire. It is something we inherit. It is a part of a very makeup. That's the truth about sin. Secondly, we learn the power of sin. That sin dwells within us is more powerful than our own willpower. Sin's power in us is more powerful than our own willpower. Just read chapter 7, verses 12 through 24. It is more powerful than the one who can say, I agree that the law is good. I agree what it says. I agree in condemning what it condemns. I do, want to, do not want to do anything that both I and the law hate, yet I do it, for the sin that dwells within me is more powerful than I, my opposition to it. You see, sin is far more powerful than our willpower. That's why we've been given the Holy Spirit, because we've not been called to live life in our own strength. You see, it's what Jesus taught in the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for those is the kingdom of heaven. We recognize our spiritual bankruptcy. I have no resources in myself I'm going to cause God to do anything. Do you realize we're never the reason God does anything? In Isaiah 48, I will forgive your sins for my holy name's sake. I'll remove your sins as far as the east is from the west for my sake. You see, God is the reason God does something, and you and I just receive the overflow of his heart. But we're never the reason God does anything. And I'm very, very grateful that I'm not the reason God would do something today because if it were the case, nothing of eternal consequence would happen during this hour. You see, God is the reason that God does something, and you and I just receive the overflow of his heart. It's utterly ridiculous to suggest that a certain amount of moral training, moral teaching, more education in regard to sex and crime consequences that follow certain actions are going to activate a more moral society in our culture. Education is not the reason. It's regeneration. And that's where you have to preach the law so people understand the heinousness of their sin. Life in the garden was simple until sin entered in. Sin introduced complications. The first sin had to be covered, then it led to lying, and so that process has continued on even today. Do not blame the truth. Do not blame God. Do not blame the law. It is the foul sin that is in us that has produced these complications in our life. When sin entered the Garden of Eden, the first things that happened were shame, blame, confusion, and death. Shame, blame, confusion, and death. That's just what we see going on. And no amount of moral training is going to alleviate that. The only answer is 725. But thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, let me conclude with this. The truth about the limits of the law. 
What Paul is most concerned to show us in chapter 7 is that the law cannot deliver us. Our only hope is, verse 7, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now, although the law is spiritual and good, it can never deliver a man from sin. It was never given to do that. It was given so that we'd see the exceeding sinfulness of our sin, and that would be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. It was never meant to be an end, but it was designed to be a means to the end. And so the answer to Paul's problem of Matthew or Romans chapter 7, verses 11 through 24, the answer is this. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord, but thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 6, we're freed from sin. Chapter 7, we're freed from the law. In chapter 8, in a few moments, you'll see that we're freed from condemnation. May God be pleased to help us enjoy our freedom as a result of the personal work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the power of your word. Father, help us just understand the sinfulness of sin, the deceitfulness of sin. Help us have a love for the law because it is what exposes us of our need for a Savior. May it serve us again daily to be a schoolmaster to lead us to the foot of the cross. Help us remind ourselves, Father, that the cross is enough. The cross is enough. Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.